Welcome to the Grand Theft World podcast, sponsored by the members of the Grand Theft World community at grandtheftworld.com. It's October 9th. This is episode 101. One Nation Under Blackmail. We're going to be getting into this book tonight, just volume one. We're going to have special guest Whitney Webb, and um, we got a lot to talk about tonight. In this week in history, in Grand Theft World history, Elon Musk decided he wants to buy Twitter. He was about to go to Discovery on his lawsuit. He decided he actually wanted to buy Twitter, which is a big turnaround. This has been going on for like six months, if you've been following the story. And then Twitter said afterwards, I don't think we want to sell to you. So now there's like another blockage in that whole thing going on. So as you all know, Elon joined the board of Twitter. Then he changed his mind. Then he offered to buy the company. He changed his mind again. Something to do with bots or some other such nonsense. That's because Elon Musk is an overgrown child, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to treat him like one. So we took him to court to make him buy. Now, he's changed his mind again. He says he wants to buy the company after all. So, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to sell. No, sir. Two can play at that game, Mr. Musk. Yes, sir. Yes, they can. Prosecution rests, Your Honor. Counselor. Uh, everything that guy just says, bullshit. Thank you. Elon Musk has said that Twitter essentially is refusing to take yes for an answer. The deal has been done. Basically, Elon came back and said, all right, well, I'll just give you exactly what, you know, exactly the exact amount of money that you wanted in the first place, all this stuff. And now... In the 11th hour, hour, Twitter is refusing Elon's new $44 billion bid. Elon himself even commenting on it, calling it a plot twist. Now, today, Elon hasn't said much. There was hope earlier in the week that he would be able to take over Twitter as early as today. However, it looks like right now, best case scenario will be earlier in the week. However, uh, who really knows at this point? Because... As far as I knew, as far as we thought, everything was good to go. And now all of a sudden, it's at a screeching, grinding halt. And it's been really bizarre to see. Uh, Zelensky came out this week. He called for a NATO nuclear preemptive strike on Russia, which is like the least strategic, strategic military decision in history or request in history. It's kind of silly, but it could end up with a big catastrophe domino effect. Uh, that could affect a, a far broader spectrum than just folks in his own country. So we better look at that. Well, here we go. Let's listen to what he says. We, what should NATO do? Eliminate the possibility of Russia using nuclear weapons. So that's his speech. He said NATO should eliminate the possibility of Russia using nuclear weapons. How do you do that? Well, let's see. Let's see what his big idea is. His big idea is, but what is important, I once again appeal to the international community as I did before February 24th, we need preemptive strikes so they'll know what will happen to them if they use nukes and not the other way around. So that if someone uses nukes on you, you then use a nuke back. He's saying we should do preemptive strikes to show them what will happen if someone uses a nuke on us. So he's calling for preemptive nuclear war. Don't they already know what happens when you, you know, nuke someone yes. that has nukes? So that's why he's saying. That's <laughs> thought we all know. Yes. He's saying let's preemptively do this. But not even for us, just for, for, for anybody. He's saying don't wait for nuclear strikes and then say, oh, since you did this, take this, take that from us. He's saying don't wait to retaliate. He's saying, you pre I bet you he would abandon this whole nuclear war thing for a three-year series on TBS. What, what you do you think? think? So? I think he would. Just TBS? I would hold out for a, maybe a Netflix? Maybe. So here he's got more to say. So he's definitely calling for nuclear first strike war. Reconsider the way you apply pressure. This is what NATO should do. Reconsider the order in which it applies pressure on Russia. <laughs> He's really saying this. He's really calling for a first strike. Um, Jeffrey Sachs came out this week 
We talked about Nord Stream blowing up. Uh, it's, it's a pipeline. It blew up in four places. We talked a little bit about it last week because it was a breaking story. Well, this week, Jeffrey Sachs, Columbia economist, came out and said he thinks the United States did it. Now, that's not my claim. That's Jeffrey Sachs. We're going like, to get to listen to his explanation behind that tonight. But that's an interesting story because the people bringing us all this green agenda potentially just committed the big eco-terror act of the year, and they want you to go eat the bugs. So there's a contradiction in that thinking. We'll break that open tonight. Also, it looks like maybe, might be, Hunter Biden could get indicted. Not for all the salacious things on his laptop, but things that are boring like tax fraud and other things his dad might have been involved in. So we're going to look into that. Just the fact that Sachs is currently being attacked by The Atlantic, where if you saw our earlier broadcast today with Zach Voorhees, we talked about how The Atlantic is painting this false narrative of the dangers of questioning things and really trying to promote and invoke a civil war amongst neighbors. All right, I just want to point that out. And now they're going to, again, attack Jeffrey Sachs, the guy who's trying to tell the truth about what? What's really going on on a global stage and extremely dangerous. What should be our response to Mr. Putin with your thoughts on war and aggression after the human atrocities that are reported. Yeah, I was attacked in the Atlantic for yes. being on the, side, on the side of peace. And uh, I confess I'm on the side of peace. Uh, I am very worried that we are on a path of escalation to nuclear war, Not, nothing less than that. Uh, we have a essentially a war in which Russia feels uh, that this war is at the core of its security interests. Uh, the United States uh, insists uh, that it will do anything to support Ukraine's defeat of Russia. Russia views this as a proxy war with the United right. States. And uh, whatever one thinks about this, this is a, a path of extraordinarily dangerous escalation. I mean, again, can you really disagree with it? I, I'm going to have one point of contention with the guy through this whole thing. But can you disagree with what he's saying here? I don't want any type of high-scale nuclear weapon being used by any side anywhere in the world. I don't think that's too much to ask. And most people, that was pretty damn well common sense especially after you had Herman Kahn put out the mad theory or mutually assured destruction theory. Most people are like, yeah, no, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, don't want to destroy humanity. Weird. And I am very curious. Right. In you space. lived this with Yeltsin. You were there for Gorbachev and Yeltsin and the rest. I remember when you got off the airplane at JFK, essentially shattered over the collapse of that first experiment. Do you have a feeling that Mr. Putin is alone? Is his military in support of him? A, a lot of the world uh, is uh, watching uh, the events in horror. Uh, and a lot of the world doesn't like this uh, NATO uh, expansion, which uh, they interpret as at the core of this. They want to see compromise between the U.S. and Russia uh, in vote after vote in the United Nations. Basically, it's been the Western countries uh, that have uh, been uh, voting for sanctions and denunciations and other actions, whereas most of the world, certainly most of the world counted by population, is on the sidelines. They just view this as a horrible clash between Russia and the United States. They don't see that right globally on the global stage, even with the people that aren't really paying attention, they get what this really is. That it's a US Russia thing. View this as we describe it in the media as uh, an unprovoked attack by uh, Russia on Ukraine. That's, you know, anyone in the United States, they'd say, well, what else is it? But that's because the way that our media have been reporting this, this conflict goes back a, a long time. It didn't start on February 24th. 
2022 would go. In fact, the, the war itself started in 2014, not in 2022, and even that had antecedents. And so most of the world doesn't see it the way we describe it, but most of the world's just terrified right yeah. now, frankly, because it's unbelievable to be hearing on one side, well, we'll use nuclear weapons if we need to, and the other side saying, ah, you can't frighten us. Well, and Professor, I mean, again, look at them. It's, it's, Sachs is on fire here. Generally, once more, most people are like, yeah, that sounds insane. That sounds totally and completely nuts. We shouldn't be doing that. All right. So th this is where I think we get to the portion that is uh, kind of going viral right now on the Internet. But again, Sachs has been pure gold throughout this whole uh, interaction. Mr. Sachs, I, I share the concern, and, and I'll be honest, I spent the weekend also reading articles about the U.S. coming up with counterattacks and, and, and proposals of what they would do in response to some of these attacks. So, you know, it's definitely a big concern. It's also an issue, as you see this sea change in the economic trajectory in Europe and beyond. And some of this does come from the energy crisis. But suddenly we're talking about inflation that we have not seen since World War II, since potentially another time of incredible distress military intervention how close are we to some sort of i don't want to say hyperinflation but persistent inflationary impulse well above target in germany in the euro area as they look to these alternative ways to suppress uh, the peripheral region from getting out of control as they raise rates in the front end well europe is in a very very sharp economic downturn uh, the sharp decline of output and living standards also shows up as a rise of prices. But the, the main fact is that the European economy is getting hammered by this, by the sudden cutoff of energy. And now, uh, to make it uh, definitive, the destruction of uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, which... So let's stop before he gets to the Nord Stream pipeline, because this is where we're going to turn into that. Think about how quick... The standard of living not only went down in Germany, but also over in France. Go pre-COVID-1984, all right? And the Yellow Jacket movement that a lot of people, one, don't remember because they were never really told about it in the media, or if they were aware of it, have kind of long forgotten. Kind of long forgotten. But things haven't gotten better over there. Remember, a lot of those people say out in the UK, they don't like the European Union. All right. They wanted out. This thing called Brexit. That never really came to fruition, did it? And at one point I thought that, wow, they're going to break up these systems. This is huge. This is a global revolution. Thank God. But these are mechanisms of this agenda to bring about what global command and control via a carbon social credit begging system also the alex jones trial number two uh is almost to a conclusion the jury is out uh the plaintiffs are asking for a range between 550 million to 7.8 billion dollars from jones ambulance chasing sandy hook lawyers asked for seven plus billion dollars for Alex Jones questioning. <laughs> but they want that number to scare everybody. I have zero concern. I'm more worried about nuclear war times a thousand. I'm more worried about fentanyl and, and, and 20 plus suicides a day in our military. So, I mean, these people are sick. You thought the Texas ambulance chasers were bad, asking for 150 million, knowing the caps at 5 million. They just asked for seven plus billion dollars. And uh, uh, aforementioned, we have guest Whitney Webb is going to talk about her book tonight. You know, what do we do? You know, what do you do when the government has to be investigated and it can't investigate itself? And so that's kind of what I hope uh, the discussion, um, you know, uh, I hope that's the, the kind of discussion that this book generates for people, particularly people who haven't really gotten into this stuff before and don't really know this history. Because, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. Um, this has an insanely huge body count. 
it's been stealing our wealth. It's been, uh, you know, motive for war after war, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, these are the people who are basically the real terrorists that we're being told that we have to fight against all the time. Um, you know, they're not who we think they are. And so, you know, how do we bring them to justice? Can they be investigated? I mean, I think it's pretty clear that we can't rely on the FBI for, you know, anything anymore. So they, what do we they do? They do hate you us know? for our freedom. They hate us for our faith. They hate us for our optimism, for knowing that we can have the human capacity to learn our way out of these problems. They've got deep capture on our justice system, political system. Yes. But at the end of the Iran Contra, I think it was the Walsh report. There was like Latin and it said, who will watch the watchers? And I think you are watching the watchers. And this is a mirror for them to see, hey, we see what you're doing and we know it's wrong. And even though we don't have all the details, we have plenty of details to know that this needs to be resisted. It needs to be scrutinized. It needs to be investigated. It needs to be adjudicated. And we are not going to continue living human generations into the future with this type of predation on ourselves, intraspecific kleptoparasitism. We don't need it. We don't want it. We didn't ask for it, but it's here. And they're still raining down their agenda harder than ever trying to like they're desperate right now. So their desperation, like they stink of desperation at this point with all the censorship and lockdowns, all this stuff. We own the science, World Economic Forum. You're going to eat bugs and like it. Uh, uh And so I really want to thank you for writing volume one and, and to talk about volume two, foreshadowing the next conversation. These are essential elements of freedom. And if you don't understand how these things come together, you're going to be getting played by the game. You're going to be part of the enterprise that they're building out there. And it's an enterprise of slavery. It's an enterprise that yeah. is- You're going to you be know, the fuel for freedom. the enterprise. Right. You're not going to be a part of it. You're going to be the fought, the cannon fodder the <laughs> for yeah. it, basically. Yeah. And last but not least, Dell Big Tree of the High Wire broke some news about the CDC and their vSafe software. They've been tracking people through the vaccine, vaccine stages of COVID. And his, his legal team has gotten together like a FOIA request lawsuit situation where they got some data. And they've made some software so we can crawl the data and actually get some real science going on in these decision-making processes. It doesn't look as sparkly as they advertised this, advertised it to us. Now that it was 463 days, you tell us, from the time that you requested this vSafe data. vSafe is a CDC program where you just kind of report how you're doing after you got the vaccine. 463 days to get it. Why did it take so long in your estimation, sir? It's a very good question. Why did it take numerous legal demands, multiple appeals, two lawsuits, in fact, before the CDC finally handed over the vSafe data, which is already de-identified data for the most part that they provided just two days ago, 144 million lines of code that they could have provided in a matter of minutes at any point? It's a great question. Maybe the answer is, is that now that we have that data and we've looked at that data, of the 10 million users within vSafe, 7.7% uh -huh. of them had to seek medical care after vaccination. That is an incredibly high percentage, it appears to me. Yeah, and, and I, if I can, and sir, I'm sure I just there want to put this graphic up to kind of follow along with you. You're right, 7.7 .7 required sure. medical care. I'm talking about emergency rooms, hospitalizations. There it is right there. And on top of that, not yeah. to, to go you one better, but this is your information, another 2.5 million, we're talking 25%, missed work or school or had bad reactions to the vaccine. What's the takeaway for you from this? Is it significant? Significant? It is. Uh, it seems incredibly significant. A big reason that they pushed the COVID vaccine is they said, look, not everybody's going to get, you know, seriously injured by COVID. But for many, it'll prevent them from having symptoms, being hospitalized, mm -hmm. uh, uh, missing work. Well, now that we have the data, we could see that getting the vaccine caused 25 percent of people who got the shot within mm -hmm. this data set of 10 million people to miss work, to have some of serious event affecting their normal life functions. Hello everyone, Del Beatrix here from The High Wire. We have breaking news. Our nonprofit, the Informed Consent Action Network, has just received the vSafe data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This is the app that was provided to those people who received the COVID-19 vaccine so that they could accurately track 
any adverse events that happened because of the vaccine. The CDC has been withholding this information from the public, and that's why our nonprofit, ICANN, sued and won. And now they've provided us with over 144 million lines of health data, a huge, gigantic file that we've assembled and put on our website. So all you have to do is go to icandecide.org slash vsafe and check it out today. Take a look at how this works. We now know on our dashboard that there was 10,094,310 people that participated in the VSafe app. Of those, 3,353,109 reported some form of an adverse reaction. That number seems huge to me, but that's just my opinion. This is not about opinion. This is the actual raw data from the CDC collated together with this amazing dashboard built by ICANN. The CDC had billions of dollars to build something like this. They didn't do it, so we did it for them. There's all sorts of ways that you can search this. And just look at all the results from Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine those that reported on the Pfizer vaccine. Perhaps you want to just look at the women in the study that were affected, and we click here. Maybe you just want to see the exact symptoms that the app was collecting. You can go to here, symptoms, and start looking through all the different symptoms that were collected in this incredible data set. You will only find it at icandecide.org slash vsafe. So uh, we'll be here for the next six or seven hours. We'll be smashing this week's uh, current events into historical context. Going on some deep dives. We also have this little juicy tidbit, the centennial issue of foreign affairs, the age of uncertainty. So we'll be sure to take a good look at that this evening as well. Let's kick it off, though, with Luke Radowski from We Are Change and TheBestPoliticalShirts.com. And uh, let's get the show on the road. We have to, you know, uh, go, going to uh, the, uh, you know, my mind's going blank now. What's happening? What, what, I can't remember. I'm going to lose track. My mind's going blank now. What are you talking about? What the hell's going on here? Where the hell are we? My mind's going blank now. I can't remember. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. What am I doing here? My mind's going blank now. Where am I headed? I keep forgetting I'm present. Where am I? No idea. Last night, the, the, the television, the, the television, I was on a telephone. Rapidly rising, uh, 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 and with, uh, with, uh, I don't know. COVID has taken more than 100 years. Look, here's a live reflected in the A-A-N-N-H-D-I. I-I-I-I-I. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the foot of the Brigada Seas building out in gates of Putin's cryptocracy. NATO's purpose is defend against aggression. Let me make, let me make, let me make that near and dear to you that you, uh, um, would like to be able to Anyway, I'm, my mind's going blank now. Now that right there is definitely a top jam, and if only he was as good as an auto-tuned singer as he was a president, maybe we wouldn't be facing the prospects of World War III and economic calamity. But hey, you can't have it all. What makes autonomy uniquely empowering? Autonomy is a self-help course unlike any other. Over the course of our 12-week program, you'll experience weekly live lectures from Richard Grove, specifically designed to equip you with the skills you need to set yourself free. Free from the learned helplessness taught in our schools, free from the dependence on a corrupt system that serves only to uphold the rich, free from the structure of your 9-to-5 if that's your prerogative. Plus, you'll enter into a community of like-minded individuals who are pursuing the same freedom you are and who'll support you and learn alongside you every step of the way. A lifetime of community and the tools to live however you want. We can't wait to meet you. Learn more at getautonomy.info.